Hi, I'm Amy M. Lee. I am an author, a publisher, and a speaker, and I own Quillhawk Publishing, which is a hybrid publisher. We focus on amplifying diverse voices, one story at a time. Welcome to The Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate you coming on. What does it mean to be Vietnamese to you nowadays? That is such a good question. Um, there's a lot of answers to this, Kenneth. I think for me, it's really unearthing the 40 years of trauma that has been um, laden with just information that I didn't know about, right? Like I didn't know I was Vietnamese until after my mother died. <laughs> Wait, and I say that loosely yeah, because, okay. <laughs> of course, I know I'm Vietnamese, but what does it mean to be Vietnamese, right? I didn't discover that until my mom passed away. So I think really being Vietnamese is waking up from a 40-year slumber. And, and all this time, I thought I was, you know, Americanized, American, what have you. But I'm starting to unearth my roots. And that came about because I wrote my books, right? And did a little bit of digging into our heritage. Um, so now to me, part of being Vietnamese is, you know, having newspaper as, as your tablecloth, you're sitting there on the on the floor eating, you are, um, it's okay to have ice in your beer and cognac at every party, you know, Hennessy or whatever, and um, not feeling full until you have rice. Like, I mean, these are little nuances to me that define our culture and uh, what Vietnamese is being is all about. What do you think is the reason? Why do you think having had your mom pass away made you kind of shift gears? She was my only tie to Vietnam, right? So when she uh, departed, it was just me and against the rest of the world. And I was floundering. Um, my dad lives in San Antonio, and I never had a relationship with him. My friends were all American, you know, Caucasian, what have you. And so having um, lost my mom and being afraid to go back to Vietnam to reconnect with my family there by myself made me realize, oh, my gosh, I don't know anything about what it is to be Vietnamese or, or our culture in general. Did you, so ever, I started looking. did you ever go back to Vietnam and reconnect with these family members? So I've been back to Vietnam four times, but the times that I've been back to connect with my family has always been with my mom or my cousin. So when we escaped Vietnam in 1979, it was my mom, my cousin and myself, and he was 16 at the time. So he really remembers, you know, all the connections to Vietnam. So going back with him was great because he could serve as the interpreter, the translator. Um, but the last trip that I went to was actually in November of 2017. And that was um, a few months after my mom had passed and she had always wanted to do this trip from north to south. So I did that trip in her honor. I did not visit my family because, again, I just didn't feel like we would be able to communicate very well. So I'm trying to change that. But yes. Before we go on, I want to first off, thank you. Uh, I want to thank you as one of the people who reached out to me from day one, I literally day one. Um, I, I remember our conversation. Yeah. And I called you and I, you know, we talked and, you know, we had a conversation, a lovely supportive conversation from you. And, um, that was two years ago. Um, I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for, you know, I watch how you support other artists and I see what you, I see your involvement in the community in the last two years. And I always thought, like if I was going to eventually get you on, I wanted to be at a point where the listenership, the audience on my side was big enough because then it would be easier to lift voices that, you know, writers that, you know, weren't part of this big publishing circle. And we'll talk about that, you know, big people like Viet Thanh Nguyen or Ocean Vuong or, you know, like, so we would get it to a point where I can now bring on people and guests that, that I really want to have on so um, you know. thank you Kenneth that's that's very intentional of you and 
I, um, I want to thank you also for this platform because you are bringing these stories to light. And I do watch almost religiously the Vietnamese podcast. I, I enjoy it on, on YouTube because I like to see people's faces and their mannerisms. But thank you. It's, it's an honor to be here. And I look forward to our conversation. Wonderful. Wonderful. So um, you got into the business of writing and the creative side and the business side much later in life. Can you tell me a little bit about that transition from nine to five work person to this sort of creative life? You mean going from five star restaurants to ramen noodles every day? <laughs> tell me about it. That creative pivot. Um, mm -hmm. So <laughs> yeah, you know, going from that, and it wasn't even a nine to five job. It was literally, you know, 14 hour days and traveling constantly and leaving that golden handcuff and the six figures behind to do what I want to do. And I didn't even know I wanted to write. It was a soul searching kind of thing. My mom was the only person in my life. Right. And so when she passed away, it was a life quake for me. It, like everything just shut down. I shut down and I took time off from my corporate career to, uh, to mourn, but to also try to figure out, okay, what does this mean now? You know, my tie to Vietnam is gone. Um, but, you know, I was just walking one day, listening to music, Prince of all things. And I heard this voice inside of me just says, you know, you need to write your mom's story. You need to keep her memory alive. You need to um, honor her, uh, honor the, the struggles that she went through. And I didn't know anything about writing. I'm not a writer. Um, so the first thing I did was buy, a, I bought a module to learn how to write fiction. And I chose fiction instead of like a, a nonfiction biography because I really didn't have all the pieces to my mom's story because she never talked about, you know, her traumas. Um, but also I wanted to encompass the other Vietnamese diaspora stories into this novel and dovetail it into my mom's story of what I know about her and her her um, her journey but you know after going through that module and then getting involved in a writing community i joined an organization i went to writing conferences and i realized okay now i'm ready and that's how i started i just started writing and researching and interviewing and you know how that goes it just leads from one thing to another um and then ultimately i decided that there's so many writers out there who just don't know what to do with their story that's in them. Um, some of them haven't even put it down to paper yet, you know, but they have this idea. And I think to be a teacher, you only have to be one step ahead of somebody to, to help them, to pull them, you know, onto the other side. And that's what I started doing. And then August 31st of this year, 2022, I officially launched Quill Hawk Publishing website. Before then, I was just doing everything on the back end and decided to turn this into an actual service, a business. If anybody looks you up online, they can find many podcasts where you talk about your writing. Today, I want to kind of step away from it, and I want to talk about the business of self-publishing because you're a hybrid service, and I think that... Um, there's a lot of, I, I, I was blown away by the, how many podcasts you've done, how many <laughs> guest podcasts you've, you've been on talking about the, the writing that you've done. So if anybody wants to know more about your life and your writing and, you know, your thoughts on that, th there's a lot out there, you know, uh, blown away. I'm very impressed by that. But um, I don't know. I couldn't find anything on, on um, Quillhawk. I couldn't find, I, obviously, because it's a new endeavor. And that's why... W that's what I wanted to really talk about today. Um, so congratulations on starting that. That's I know how Thank difficult you. starting these new endeavors are. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, Bullhawk officially formed in December of 2019. And I didn't really do anything with it um, until May of this year when Media Vines was just starting. It's a media company and website design company. Um, owned by a brother, sister, Vietnamese duo. And I had been friends with one of them for, you know, socially on, on social media for two years. And he was like, I see the hustle that you're doing, but let's turn this into a business. And he's like, I, I think there's a need out there for it. Um, 
So he reached out to me. He, we started this whole website design process. I scratched my whole Amy Lee author website, ground zero, right? And built this Quill Hawk Publishing website um, by August 31st. I had this sexy website and I said, let's officially launch this. I had a uh, virtual launch party. Normally I do virtual book launch parties, but this was an actual Quill Hawk Publishing launch party. I invited all of my authors who had signed with me. I had invited um, partners who were working with me to bring these stories to life. And we just had spent 90 minutes together talking about the business. And that is my go-to video now when I have people who come to me and say, you know, what are you guys all about? I say, watch this video and then set up time with me and we can go through your journey and answer your questions. So, wow. You know, there's a, uh... There's many sectors of this conversation that we can take. Um, we could talk, talk about the sort of the the economic mechanical side of the money, the numbers, which I'm always very interested in because the traditional way of getting signed and published is one route. Self-publishing is another. Hybrid, which is what you just mentioned, is another. And I'm always curious to, to know sort of when a writer is – in the middle of the road and they're trying to you know figure out this way or that way you know what what the, what are the main points the pros and the cons so you know this conversation go many ways so yeah. the first way is did you self-publish your stuff your writing your books i did um and i want to say one more thing is that there is a fourth avenue and that is vanity press um vanity publishing and I would recommend everybody to stay away from Vanity Press. I actually call it vampire uh, publishing because it's it, they really feed on the author's um, flounderings and the author's ego as well, depending on which side you think. Was, so wait, what is, vanity, what is Vanity Press? Vanity Press? So Vanity Press is a company or a publishing house, right, a business that will publish your book and they don't care about what the topic is they, you know, you're basically paying a lot of money to get your book published. And there's no guarantee that there's any quality behind that. There's there any promoting marketing. Um, a lot of the vanity presses will actually, they actually go under and um, they feed on the money aspect of, of the business, right. But they don't have any follow through. And so they end up owning all these rights to the books and then when they go under or they don't deliver, the author is stuck. Um, it's a very painful, painful process. But back to your question, I did self-publish all of my books. Um, Snow in Vietnam was my debut. After 30 rejections, I did get uh, a contract to traditionally publish and super excited. But when I read through the contract and I didn't have an agent, I went directly to the editor. Um, I was not happy with my contract and I tried to negotiate with them and they wouldn't budge. And I said, forget that. I'm going to go on my own. And again, this is at a time when I thought I was just going to do one book. I was going to honor my mom and then I was going to go back to the golden handcuffs. Uh, but obviously that didn't, that didn't happen. So here can I you, am. Can you share some points of that first deal? Um, the royalty was 6%. And it, granted, it was a smaller press. It wasn't like one of the top five big traditional publishers, right? And so you can expect less royalties. But there was no clarity on whether they were going to do, um, if they were just going to do ebooks or if they're going to do print as well or audio books. You know, I wanted to make sure I retain rights to like the movie rights or, you know, merchandise. Um, that's one of the things I think J.K. Rowling did a really good job when she negotiated her contract. She kept rights for pretty much everything. Um, so just the fact that they weren't willing to work with me on anything told me that this is not the right path for snow in Vietnam. Yeah, so. that, that, that would be a deal breaker if they're not willing to budge at all. Okay. Yeah. So then you had this, you know, experience of like publishers that you didn't think that would be a good fit. And you go to yourself and you say, you know, I can do this or did somebody else say, hey, there's another route to this? Like, did you come up with this? And did you always have a plan B in your mind going, if I don't get picked up, I'm going to go out and do it? I didn't even know anything about self-publishing. Uh, what happened was I went to a conference 
a writer's conference in May here in Oklahoma. And I spoke to a lot of authors who were both hybrid. You know, I mean, they were both um, self-published and traditionally published. And I heard the pros and cons on either side, on both sides. And one author told me a story that just scared me. <laughs> um, and she said, you know, she went the traditional route, but she hated the cover. The uh, editors made her change the ending and um, gave her a very short amount of time to do that. And in the end, the ending that she redid, they didn't even, they kind of Frankenstein it all together and it didn't even make sense, right? When you when you read the book, she said. Um, the other thing is they their editors didn't catch certain things. For example, her one of her characters was riding a motorcycle and instead of wearing a bandana, it, they, were, they were wearing a banana, right? <laughs> so it was oh one of those editing things God. that didn't get caught. Um, but she couldn't change it. I mean, it's stuck there for the next seven years and they didn't release it uh, when she wanted it released either. They actually, re- it should have been a Halloween piece, honestly, but she said that they didn't release it until February. Um, and then, so she stuck with it for the next seven years and she didn't want to like even promote her book. And part of being an author is you have to promote your book, right? Whether you traditionally or self-published. So those kinds of, you know, stories scared me. And I thought, you know what, I want full control and being in the corporate space, I'm very OCD anyway. So I was like, I'm going to figure this out. Um, I also had a vision in my mind of what I wanted the cover to look like. I wanted it to be really representative of my mom. And, you know, when you, when you traditionally publish, you don't have control. control. Yeah. You might have a little bit of a saying, but ultimately you don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you decide you're going to do this. And how do you go about laying down the numerical foundations, the sort of financials of the endeavor? So self-publishing, it can cost anywhere between 50. Well, let me take that back. It can cost $125 on up to $70,000, for example, right? It really depends on how how much do you want to layer your, your cover design? You, how much do you want to spend on editing, which, you know, editing is a huge piece. You can spend money on anything. It's the editing and the cover. Um, I actually, because I had been in the corporate space, I, we had some money tucked away. And because we moved from Seattle to a lower cost of living, uh, that was also helpful. And my husband, you know, his career just took off here in Oklahoma. So all the financial pieces, thankfully, was um, wrapped up in my mm. husband's career, right? So I was very lucky. But um, I actually, luck- luckily, I had a mentor. Actually, when I went to this conference, I met an author who's a teacher and lives in Texas. And he kind of walked me through his process. And that- that's how I started, right? Because he was teaching me a little mm. bit of the behind the scenes stuff. And I just went with it. And I'm I persistent and stubborn. And I think um, that's what got me through. At one point, I was so exhausted, I was ready to just throw my computer at the wall. I was like, I can't figure out this Ingram Spark thing. I can't upload. (laughs) I get all these errors. Why am I getting all these errors? And uh, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, you just got to keep on, keep on keeping. Yeah, that's that, that kind of stuff scares me too. I can't when things go haywire, and especially on my computer and stuff like that, it's so hard to troubleshoot. Yeah. It prevents and, me from doing a lot of big things because of that. I'm I'm kind of you know when I was in Microsoft, we call we call it dog fooding, right? Like you dog food all of the um, software stuff that's going to be released, and so you get to taste all the bad stuff. You get to test things out, pilot things uh, before it's released to the public. Even when there's little bugs, we still release it, right? Because you're on schedule and on budget. But I used to not be intimidated by technology since I stepped away from it and started just writing. All I care about is my computer and my word document. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm with you. And when it comes to technology, I was like, Ugh. I call my son who's 13. Yeah. They can figure it out. <laughs> so when uh, you go out and you start to do this um, on your own and you come up with uh, a budget and there's choices to make, right? Editors, book, graphic designers, publishing, like uh, do-it-yourself uh, presses that can publish. Where do you start to kind of get all this information and learn 
the numbers, um, where things go. So this is why it's very important to be a part of a writing community, join writing organizations, attend workshops, attend online events, belong to um, established organizations, right? I attended, um, I think I attended two or three conferences before I actually went through the publishing process myself and understanding how much it costs, for example, an ISBN number, right? Which is an international standard business number, I think it is called. Um, it costs $125, $125 for one ISBN number, which is registered through Bowker. Bowker is the only US agency that um, sells ISBN numbers for authors to register their book. So understanding that I have to have an ISBN number for each format of my book, unless it's an ebook that's published on KDP, which is Amazon's Kindle. Um, understanding how much a cover is going to cost if you need a license for your for your picture. And for me, because I was very specific, I poured over thousands of photos before I found this one, and then I bought the license for it. Um, having a good graphic designer, you know, graphic designers can cost three hundred to three thousand uh, for your cover. So. Like I said, attending these events and talking to other seasoned authors and trying to understand what your path is and how much you can afford really um, helped me to decide what I wanted to do with my with my book. But because I'm also a great uh, networker, even though I am an introvert, naturally, being in the corporate space prepared me because I had to step up and I had to talk to people and network and build these relationships. Because when I was in the executive space, um, I dealt with all these C-level, you know, crazy people who are A-type personalities who wanted things yesterday. And you have to be super creative. And it's all about who you know to deliver what they want. Having those networks really helped me to keep my costs down. And people wanting to see me succeed. So they were willing to do it pro bono or discount or what have you. So I, I published Snow in Vietnam, I think, for um, $500. Yeah, very Holy doable. Cow. What about, <laughs> what about the um, publicity side of it? How, do you, how did you push that publicity side and get the word out? Yeah. So it took me two years to write Snow in Vietnam. As soon as I had this idea in my head, I told everybody. So people were coming along this journey with me for two years. And I knew right then and there that I had to like tell everybody about it, not only to make myself accountable, but to get people excited with me. Right. So when, when Snow and Vietnam published, um, all my friends and family bought it. Right. And I had um, three virtual, sorry, three book launches personal in Vietnam, in-person book launches. So that was great this was before COVID, obviously. Um, and then I had to hustle and try to find bookstores that would be willing to host an unknown indie author, self-published author, um, which I did, you know, which was a great thing. But, you know, after you hound all your friends and families and their friends and family, it really boils down to branding and um, getting on social media, doing the Facebook ads or, or whatever ads you can do to get it out there. And then really pushing the, the reviews because reviews are food on the table, you know? And I tell this to everybody who's like, oh, I loved your book. And I said, thank you, please write a review. <laughs> yeah. Because that's how we get known, so. Social proof is very important. Yes. Viet Tan Nguyen talks about the plenitude of stories that we should push in our lives and in our community. You know, why, why would we not have every voice put our thoughts out there, you know, in books or poems or rap music or music? Just the plenitude of stories is a very important thing. But economics in the creative field plays a big part. What should we be paying attention to as we you know, depart from these, you know, nine to fives, these traditional jobs into the creative field, such as writing. And how do we, you know, what, what would be a game plan? What do you advise to somebody who is where you were maybe six years ago thinking about, I got to like step off and, and, and do this? I would definitely say that being an entrepreneur or a creative, whatever, you know, um, 
you have to have a solid plan. You also have to have faith, but you become your own boss, right? So you really have to, I would say, be accountable for your time, be accountable for your reward and recognition, treat yourself as an employee, not just as the boss. Um, when you're starting out by yourself, it's a very lonely journey. Yeah. So how do you stay motivated? And, and I mean, treat yourself as a corporation, you know, you got to do the team building, you got to look at your financials, you got to partner partnerships is, is amazing. And then you take one, one customer. Well, that customer is going to give you back tenfold. Um, so that's how I would say what I would say is somebody who's making that pivot to really think about think about it as a business and think about you as not only the boss but the employee what are some of the preconceptions that you had before you got into the business the book business some of the preconceptions you had versus some of the notions that you came out of over the last few years um well, <laughs> some of the preconceptions I, I had, I think, was that it was easy to publish, um, that it was easy to find a an agent. You know, I felt very strong about my story, that it was diverse, that it was, I thought my writing was good. Apparently, 30 people who rejected me didn't think it was good enough or wasn't the right timing or wasn't right for them, right? Um, and the thing is, regardless of whether you self-publish or indie, uh, or sorry, um, traditionally published, you're still responsible for marketing your book. And I didn't, I had no clue. I didn't know that that was the case. I thought if you traditionally publish, you have this whole team behind you, all this budget behind you and that they would do everything for you. So now being on the other side, I realized that um, it doesn't matter what you do, you're still in the game and you're still responsible and accountable for your book baby. So, so either, either either side of this, whether it's traditional, big publishing company does it, or you do it yourself through self-publishing, you it lands on you to to promote. Yeah, absolutely. Because unless you're, you know, Stephen King or J.K. Rowling, here's the thing: a lot of traditional publishers lose so much money yeah. on, when they sign an author, and sadly, most books don't sell more than two hundred copies. Um, and that's just the way it is. But, you know, once they do find that one, um, golden goose egg or, or what have you, you know, it just makes up for all the other authors that didn't make money for them. It's kind of like a film studio. You make 10, hopefully one becomes a blockbuster hit pays for the whole studios. Yeah. Expenses. Absolutely. Same thing with publishing, I think. So, um, but, you know, I would be open to traditionally publishing um, at one point uh, if the right agent comes along and the right story comes along. I thought I was going to do that with the Copper Phoenix. I really wanted to try the traditional route again um, or, you know, do all the querying and the pitching. But here's the thing, too, is that the Copper Phoenix is a ghostwriting project for me. And even though I and the other person are going to be co-authors on this book, um, we had to take into consideration some of the things that life brought in front of us. And in that sense, she's now dealing with uh, cancer, right? And so we don't know how much longer she's going to have. And therefore, we decided, okay, let's just indie publish this one to get it out the door. Because traditionally, publishing can take a long time to get it out on the shelves. Why is that? Well, I think part of it is there's probably about 4 million books that are published a year <laughs> globally. Wow, that, that's a <laughs> that real number. Or that's a just... real number that includes, that includes self-publishing. Yes. Um, but when you have all these books that are scrambling to get uh, attention, there's only so much manpower yeah. you can put behind a book. Right. So even when you, let's say you spend six months and you pitch and you query and you finally get an agent that says, yes, I'm going to take you on. I'm going to represent you. That agent, by the way, is going to take 15% of your royalties. That agent will also spend another six months to maybe even a year to sell your book to a publisher. That publisher will then go through their internal editing process and all this other stuff. And sometimes, you know, you're selling a manuscript that's not even complete yet. It's just the promise of being complete. 
So there's there's a lot behind it. And then go through the editing process and then they finally put it, you know, in queue to, to publish. So yeah, it can take, I think, um, maybe two, three years to actually get your book published if you go the traditional route. And how much shorter is it if you go through self-publishing? Uh, I would say one to six months. Depends on how far along you are. Yeah. Yeah. Then what is the benefit of going with the big publisher? <clears throat> well, there's a lot of benefits because especially if you have an agent, you know, that agent is there to negotiate for you. That agent has the relationship. Um, the publishers obviously have relationships and Traditionally publishing, there's no cost up front for you. You get an advance. Um, you have to earn that advance before you start earning your royalties or getting royalty payments. Um, but there is that. And for those who don't know anything about self-publishing, that's really, and if they're patient, you know, they can afford the time. That's the really good, good route to go. You can also be on the New York Times bestselling list. It's really hard to get on that list as a self-publisher um, because New York Times bestselling list isn't truly a, um, the best selling, right? Or the most selling because you do have self publishers who could sell way more books than a traditional, but um, it's kind of a, I think a popularity game. It's also how many editors are willing to back your book up um, to put it on a bestseller list. Wow, oh, interesting. The politics of the, the businesses. No, there's politics everywhere, right? Fascinating. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's it's uh, you know, it could. You think that you know at the upper levels, like all of this stuff is you know it's clockwork, right? It's easy to to figure out, but it's a lot more complicated than than it seems to me. Yeah, and then you have people who cheat, you know, and they'll if yeah. they have money, they'll buy a hundred thousand dollars worth of their books just to make it on that bestseller list it's just crazy what people will do and and does that mark of bestseller actually make a difference in the way we purchase yeah think about it right i mean that's what you see and and you think okay it's going to be an amazing story it's well written it's well edited the cover is amazing it's going to grab me um but when you get to stephen king's um, stage where you don't need a traditional publisher anymore. You can self-publish if you wanted to, which I think he does some of his books. Um, but if you read some of those books, are they edited well? And even if they're traditionally published, are they edited well? Because when you have Stephen King's name on there, which is way bigger than the title of the book already, people are not going to spend that time to, you know, they want to get it out the door. They want to make money off of that name. Um, who cares if it's not edited well? That makes sense. That's, yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what gives you the strength to do this? It's a hard path. What gives you the inspiration to keep going? And you've got what, like four or five, how many books are, are you into now? Yeah, so I published four. I'm working on the fifth one, The Copper Phoenix. The Asian Women Trailblazers one I'm a part of, but I didn't publish it. Yeah. But what gives me the strength and the and the motivation is I've been there. You know, I the first time I held my book baby, Kenneth, it was just this emotional rush. You know, all that hard work and all of the, the tears. Um, it was just a, a euphoria that I can't explain. But I want that for other authors too, other writers who don't know where to go, what to do. And it's been a true joy to just see people have this dream and um, and then see their reaction when they're doing their unboxing video or what have you, and they're holding their book. Even if it's a proof copy, they get really emotional and excited. And that's what feeds me when I see those. Yeah, it's a long journey to finish a book if you even finish it. <laughs> I don't know how people push them out like once a month or once every few. I don't, it's just it's crazy. What What's your own metrics of success as a writer for yourself? Personally, for myself, it really is just to finish the book and get it out the market. But because um, writing is hard, you know, and a lot of people spend 10 years or, or they say, oh, I'm going to publish or I'm going to write a book. And they, they never do. Um, so just to get to that finish line, 
uh, is a success for me. And then just to have that one good review, the one that just gushes over it, and then they follow you. Um, I have this guy in Florida who's a Vietnam War veteran, discovered my book. And in the past, you know, three years, he's been my my cheer, cheerleader, my champion. Mm. He'll buy anything that I'm selling because he just truly believes in in what I'm doing. And and the book hit him so hard uh, in terms of understanding the culture, understanding what happened to the Vietnamese people um, and healing, you know, knowing that that they the ones who did make it are doing well. So you you I'm going to go back to what you said earlier in the episode, you said something about trauma and 40 years of it and the process of working through it. Do you think any of that will ever get old for you or for our community for that matter? The trauma piece? Yes. I think it's going to take another two generations for that to go away or at least be better. Um, you know, the one point zero generation, they're getting older, they're dying. Um, the Vietnam War veterans are getting older, they're dying, they're taking their stories with them. But the thing about trauma is that it is uh, multi-generational. It is, uh, if you ever read the book, the body keeps the score, we hold on to the trauma, we pass it on to our, our family. It's in how we talk to them, how we raise them, um, you know, how we discipline them, how we educate them. And so I think because I'm a 1.5, I think you are too. Is that right? Um, generation? Um, 2.0. You're 2.0. So, you know, I look at my son who's 13, who was born here. And I know he has a little bit of my trauma because I, you know, it's that same old thing. Do you know what I went through? What? grandma went through, you know, so it's embedded in his brain and in his body. And I think it's not until he has children um, and their children have children, right? That we really start to move away from the trauma. Well, they said uh, there's theories on it being epigenetics, epigenetically passed through, which is like, do our DNA through ourselves moving on down? I, I think so. I agree. You know how, like when you, um, when you buy beef, you know, and they say that, oh, if you, if you have a cow that's gone through this whole wonderful, luxurious yeah. life, you know, um, the meat's going to be tastier, better, whatever. I think that there's some truth to that because you do hold on. It changes the chemistry, I think, of your body if you hold on to these kinds of fears and, and trauma. You have another thing, too, that... Uh besides the writing and besides the publishing, uh, which is your relationship with uh, heart congenital heart defect. Um, can we talk a bit about that and how it's sort of shaped your thinking and your world? Yeah, so uh, you're talking about the Heart Community Collection, which was formed in February of, um, gosh, 2021. So we're heading on two years. Um, so I was born with a hole in my heart. I was born with a congenital heart defect called atrial septal defect, which is a hole in the upper chambers of my heart. And this was, you know, nine months before the fall of Saigon. So my mom was told that I wasn't going to live past the age of five. You know, that was their prediction. She hustled to get out of the country to find um, freedom and medical care for me. We came to the United States in 1980. <clears throat> and just shortly after my sixth birthday, I ended up having open heart surgery at Seattle Children's. And then that was it for me. I continued on with my life. Um, didn't know I had a heart defect, just carried on, you know, never mind that I came last in running the mile or what have you, but I just kept going. And it wasn't until uh, through a friend of a friend that I ended up on this podcast, the uh, Heart to Heart with Anna podcast that we talked really more about my CHD and my journey. And she helped me to connect with my surgeon and the medical illustrator that had worked on me back in 1980 when I was six years old. So as soon as wow. she connected me with them, um, I flew immediately to Seattle to meet them. And it was life changing. But because I met Anna on this heart to heart podcast, and she had been doing this podcast for she's the longest running CHD podcast show. 
that I decided, you know what, I need to dig a little bit more into this CHD that I have. And it opened up a whole new world for me. And we formed the Heart Community Collection with one other gal. So it was Jenny Muscatel, Anna uh, Jaworski, and myself. We formed this for the purpose of providing a resource for the CHD community and to let them know they're not alone. You know, I grew up not knowing any other child, uh, let alone a Vietnamese child <laughs> with a CHD. And it has opened up doors where I, through Tracy, right, the Vietnamese boat people, um, I met the doctors who, not met, but I, you know, virtually I met them, uh, the doctors who started Healing Hearts Vietnam, and they raised money to do heart surgeries in Vietnam. And you can do a heart surgery in Vietnam for like $800 versus here. I don't even want to know how many it co- yeah. how much it costs here, right? You know, the, um, the actual condition of having a hole in, in our heart, it's not too uncommon, right? It Like, there's... It, it, yeah. it occurs a lot in babies, uh, I've heard. Yeah, so one in 100 babies are born with the CHD. Wow. And usually it is a heart murmur that will resolve itself. Got it. Um, but out of the 100, maybe one out of four, right, will actually have a very serious condition. And um, there's a lot of CHDs. Uh, there's probably at least 10, 12 different kinds of congenital heart defects. And a lot of them are pretty complicated and pretty serious. But you're right, it's pretty, pretty normal. People don't realize that heart murmurs are a normal thing. Yeah, because I remember, I think somewhere along my mom and maybe another sister of hers had it. Um, I remember another relative. So I, I just kept hearing about it over the years. And uh it's it's it sounds a lot scarier than it perhaps p- potentially is, but I mean it's like uh, the journey. The the beauty is the journey that you went through as a result of sort of tracing back and tracking back just the storytelling aspect of this. Yeah, I feel like it's like little cookie crumbles, you know, that yeah. I'm trying to uh, find my way back. And you know, honestly, it wouldn't have happened if my mom didn't pass away when she did. Um, I was at a stage in my life where things were good and I was mature enough, ready enough, I guess, to be on this journey alone, but in some ways not alone because I have my family, of course, and my network of people who support me. You know, I want to talk about the book that you were included in, The Asian Women Trailblazers uh, Who Boss Up, um, Mm -hmm. the book that I see on the screen right there and your involvement. And uh, tell me, you know, we have... uh, quite a few pretty badass uh, entrepreneurs in our community. Um, But how, how is it uh, that you were included in that uh, collection? So the women who boss up books and the movement itself was started by Tam Luck. And she is African American woman. And excuse me, she is married to an Asian man. um, And she's got a marketing background. And but She's also, you know, an author and a publisher. But anyway, she start, She went through this journey of wanting to really empower women to spotlight um, their stories. And she just started, initially started watching people on social media, watching women, what they were doing, um, these entrepreneurs or these creatives, whatever. And that's how this movement started, where she was reaching out to them. And you do go through an application process. You know, she wants to really dig into your story. Um, But once you're in, you're in. And the Asian Women Trailblazers uh, who boss up book, I think it's the eighth book in the in the series or in the boss up series. But it's also the second that is featuring strictly just Asian women. The first one was uh, Asian women who boss up. So that's how I got involved. And it was originally Yes, I got involved with it in January. It was supposed to be published in May, but it didn't get out until August just because things happened. But um, it's been an amazing journey to get to know the other 15 women. Um, one of them I actually met in person uh, when I was in Virginia a couple months, or last month. But I've gotten to know five of them pretty well uh, through this process and we're very supportive of each other. So they're, yeah. And how do books like this, uh, and even we could talk about your books too, 
how do they find their home, their readership? How do they find their readership? It really is, um, it's not just for women, right? It's really about the men who have strong women in their life who, or who have boss ladies in the making in their life, right? Um, I, you know, you probably see me on social media all the time and I really want to spotlight just any woman really. Um, and I think that's how they find their home or find their readership because there's a lot of women out there who are dealing with imposter syndrome or who just, you know, want to take it to the next level. And those are the kind of women who are just hungry for resources and hungry for connection. And they want to know what's, what's out there. What is everybody else doing? And I think that's the value in this book. Plus when you back it up with, um, you know, every purchase goes towards, uh, yeah. a nonprofit organization that really people helps want to stand behind that too yeah. Yeah. yeah have you been to vietnam four times we even thought about living there at one point and retiring there <laughs> so that's actually more my husband who's you know he's like swedish irish like just a mix of yeah but why would you not do that um mostly because of preston my son you know, if he, if he was kids. younger, he would have no choice yeah. <laughs> and he would just acclimate, but he is older now. Um, and I, I think, you know, Vietnam has, it changes every single time I've been back and it will continue to evolve. And I think um, maybe, you know, one day there's still that, that opportunity to go back and stay there for, for the long haul. These damn kids. <laughs> I tell you, we only have one. <laughs> I know. If I didn't have my kids, I'd be long gone as well. Really? To Vietnam? Yeah. Uh, I love Vietnam. I'd love to live there. I talk about that so much that I break microphones because of this. <laughs> well, what brings you back? What do you love so much about it? Uh, that's a great question. Because we're part of a whole. So From... I've listened to some of your episodes, Kenneth, and you feel you feel like you're straddling this fence, right? Or this line where you're not Vietnamese, you're not American, you're not sure yet exactly what your identity is yet, but there's something about the motherland that keeps pulling you back and you say you want to live there. So I'm kind of- I, I, I want to be a part of a population that I am a, in, it's a homogeneous, it's like 100% us. I just want to feel that for a few years. Mm. That makes sense. Um, because I think at some point there's no place like home, right? It's the familiarity of it. Even if I think if you've never been back to Vietnam, you've been there only, or you're going back for the first time, there's that familiarity that, oh, you know, just little nuances of sayings, or you remember what your family um, talked about, or, you know, you start to piece things together. It's kind of like having a face to a name, right? You start seeing, oh, this is Bung Tao, or this is Guk Wak, or this is what, you know, Hope you alone really is. <laughs> um, Absolutely, but I've I've stayed for prolonged weeks at a time and over twenty years now, and I speak it. I'm fluent in it. I read and write. I sing. I have family there. My brother lives there. I I feel at home there. I don't know how long I could last there, <laughs> mm. um, but I live through the fantasy of saying I'm. A, I mean, I think I could. I could theoretically live there forever. I think we're adaptable, right? I mean, if we can adapt to the U.S., we can adapt back to Vietnam. I'll tell you, when I my very first trip back there with my mom, uh, it was definitely a humbling experience, but we were there for a whole month. And by the time we left Vietnam, I took, I took Vietnam with me in my heart, and I was thinking in Vietnamese. I was dreaming mm -hmm. in Vietnamese. I was on the airplane trying to write an email to my husband, who was a boyfriend at the time. I could not remember how to spell the word school. Like it was just, <laughs> so I think, you know, if we went back there and we stayed long enough, we would be um, fully immersed in yeah. there. Yeah, and I have another problem. I have the FOMO that the developing world, it's like developing without me. You know, mm -hmm. it's like this whole 98 million people are, developing layers of characteristics that is like an we are the offshoot and the satellite they're the mother ship that's growing and layers are being put on and i'm not being able to be there like 
their rap or their uh you know their their own sense of country music or whatever that they're listening to and the new people are a part of a culture that's growing and i feel fomo i feel like i'm not part of that growth and it's not easy to like okay let me just go to youtube and then get related searches and then you know tune into the rap and so it, you got to like be there to live it and to feel it do you feel that being Vic you or or being just not you know like a, you didn't stay through the whole entire thing uh with vietnam that that is what keeps pulling you back like you feel like you're not being true to yourself what do you mean sense. What, what do you mean um, you know, I always say like, you've got to live your true self, right? Be your truly authentic self. And to be truly authentic in one aspect of it is to be fully immersed in Vietnam, to grow up with the culture and the economy and the progressiveness of it. Um, otherwise you feel like you're left out or you are that stepchild, that offshoot, whatever. Yes, I see, I don't know the answer to that because uh, I've never really left for a long period of time. I've never left LA for a long period. I mean, other than San Diego for three years, Japan for one year while I was in the service, but those don't count really. I've never really left it, left it. I always knew LA was going to be a base for mine for a long time. Now, if I leave here and go to Vietnam for a few years, I'm curious if I'm going to be having FOMO about what's happening in LA or the United States. I doubt it though. I really? I it. think you would. I, because it's it's a part of you. You're so you've got yeah. roots here too, right? Yeah, but in it's, LA. it's not I don't think that things change here in LA. Things yeah. don't change. It's it's almost like England being alive or around for a thousand years and it's not much Vietnam is changing. You could see it every six months. It's You're right. It's it's the, the speed at which it's the changing. Speed, yeah. 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 Yes. Is that why you go back like what three times a year i think you yes. mentioned that on one of your shows that is why i go back three times a year uh you know and to tend to business and hang out with my brother that's another thing too i am really upset at the fact that i'm growing up he and i are growing up and we're not hanging out together every day it just yeah. bothers me so much we were so close we're a year apart and i always felt very close to him and vice versa and we talk a lot over uh video now but, you know, um, I hate the fact that we're growing old without each other uh, in our in each other's lives because we're, we're, we're very opposite. And mm -hmm. it's just wonderful to have. It's just very comforting for me as a younger brother to know that I have just badass older brother who exists in yeah. the world. So that's yeah. a big it's a big deal for me, too. So well, home is they say home is where you hang your hat. Yeah. Right? And it seems like your brother is home. It's He's home. But he was yeah. born there, so you know he's home. Yeah, so that's probably why you you could totally live in Vietnam and be okay with it. You yeah, so, it's your family. <laughs> yeah, and the thing about this podcast is that it's sort of like me uh, asking everybody, "What does it mean to be Vietnamese?" Because I'm still, I will always be searching for that within our tribe, within our Vietnamese tribe globally. I've always wanted to know what am i because i'm still trying to figure that out and i and i say that i'm still trying to figure it out it's it's not even close to being uh, figured out yet so and then at the end of every one of them i always ask if you've been back to vietnam how much you know because these are the things that i long to be part of that experience yeah. is going back to live there and um one day sort of you know um being part of that society and being proud of the hundred million people that are that we call our you know and i'm proud of being american i'm proud of the history that you know that that that, that i've gone through but you know enough of the pride i want to like live it so let me ask you this like when you go back to vietnam do you see only and do you experience only good parts of vietnam and is that why it keeps bringing you back because you have that warm and fuzzy feeling about it interesting question very great question in the beginning, uh, no. In the beginning, uh, I went everywhere. I would sit and eat anywhere. I would go anywhere. For the first, I don't know, 10 years maybe, 15 years, I would really live like, you know, people in Vietnam. I would eat anything and be anywhere. When I go back to Vietnam now, I just, I stay at my brother's house and I just hang out there and, you know, do work and write and edit. And 
I just hang out in the room and then we'll go to dinner and then I'll sleep during the day that if I'm over and then I'll go to the gym. It's like being at home. There's no mm -hmm. difference now. I, I don't, it's not, for me, it's not a novelty to, to go eat. Well, you know, I'll have my favorite noodle restaurant. I have my favorite rice place, my barbecue place. It's like going home. So that's, it's a different level for me now. It's not, I don't experience Vietnam like a foreign place anymore. It's just a place that I come home, I put my bags down and I start to work and I hang out with my brother and it's like a, like I'm just at home. Yeah. Well, okay. This is not the same comparison. It's kind of apples and oranges, but that's how I feel about going back to Seattle. Mm. You know, Oklahoma is different than Washington state. And so for me, Seattle is home. When I go back there, just, the rain and the earth and the the mountains mm -hmm. and the valleys and everything, you know, it just, all that just encompasses me, engulfs me and I feel whole. Right. Um, so I don't know, you know, maybe that's, that's you with Vietnam, but yeah. there is a beauty of Vietnam for sure. I love waking up to the sound of roosters. I mean, that's the first sound that you hear wow. that in the, you know, I don't know, you, you hear the baguette lady or you hear the, the horns go blaring, but um, just walking out to that heat. And I love heat. I don't like the cold at all. So maybe that's why another thing that draws me back to Vietnam, even though I left there when I was five years old, you know. Um, but yeah, your your body, your it's nostalgic, I guess. That's part of it. And it um, could be epigenetics so as well, where we like the heat, where our bodies are, you know, acclimated for thousands of years mm -hmm. in the heat. And now we're made to live in these cold climates and it's a little, in Vietnamese, we call it book boy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know a little Vietnamese. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little aggravating, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a question I grapple with a lot. You know, I, I deal with this uh, question quite a bit and i sometimes I feel guilty for like just continuing to dwell on it. Cause a lot of people older than me don't care. Younger people don't care. I just, I just happen to be obsessed with this one question, you know, why is it so damn important to be Vietnamese? Why is it so special? Why is it so good to be Vietnamese? Why is it so amazing? Why is our food so great? Why is it so, so much pride to be Vietnamese? And then there's that shame, that deep shame that I experience as well. All of this mm. is constantly plaguing my, my mind and my existence. Hmm. Well, just keep on this journey. You'll find your answers eventually, you know, otherwise just get high and then you'll find your answers. <laughs> <laughs> or, Have some or, shrooms. I don't know. You'll go on this journey. <laughs> yeah, no, no. That was uh, 10 years ago. Um, no, now I substitute it with a lot of reading. I do a lot of, uh, I try to do as much reading as I can, but not just um, the Vietnamese, you know, uh, world, but like really exploring Asian American literature now, um, and even like going back to like black liter African American black literature, black writers to really understand like all of these roots of what we're reading today, what trickles down to Asian Americans and then Vietnamese Americans have their sort of like roots that we could trace back to Richard Wright from Black Boy. You know, I, I talk about that book um, every now and then. It's uh, you know this experience of this uh, black writer who you know experienced the south when he was like eight years old and his growth through through the mississippi south um in the 20s was was brutal beyond belief and um there's so much significance trickled down to modern writers in the vietnamese american space asian american space that you could say wow this is there's some lineage that uh adjacency as well that's happening I'm so glad that you're reading because um, what I love about books is it's just you and the book, you yeah. and the story, and you're forced to listen. You know, there's no other distraction or noise and um, it's just you and what's on the page. And I think more and more people need to get back to reading in which they are. I mean, there was a point where, you know, people weren't reading books and bookstores were shutting down and everything, but that's, I think the tides are turning back again. So I, I enjoy reading as much as I can get a chance to, but um, a lot of my time now is spent on editing, yeah. um, which, you know, I'm still reading because I'm editing, but yeah, the last book, actually right now I'm listening to an audiobook. book. Um, it's The Bronze Drum and um, 
actually Brian Huang uh, had been, had listed it and I was like, oh, I need to do that one. And it's very interesting. It's not what I expected at all. It's no, about the Trump sisters. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. You know, uh, Fong uh, Nguyen was on uh, the the podcast and he talked about it and his journey. And then we had the the person that he kind of consulted with, with the uh, arche archaeological Nam Si Kim was also on the podcast to talk about his work on sort of like reconstructing the history to kind of keep it. Yeah. So both those guys were, were on and uh, fascinating. I have a question. Uh, well, you me. know, Lee yeah. Tran is going to be writing a book about the Trung sisters, um, House of Six, right? Yes, yes. yes. So I'm curious to know how she's going to twist this story when she publishes hers. But yeah. Anyways, yeah. Your question? I talked to her about that too. Um, yeah. I asked her because, you know, I said, yo, you know, now that Fong has, you know, done it, you know, uh, what's your... She's like, yeah, there's so much to that, the, the tale of those two sisters that could be retold in, in many different ways. Yeah. yeah. My question is, um, well, before I ask the question, I can't even get to reading anymore on a regular book. I, I order books to have in my library, but it's much easier to do audio books for me because I learn much better with my ears than with my eyes. It's hard for me to remember facts when I see it, but when mm -hmm. I can listen. So have you done any audio books yet with your work? No. So funny story is that um, when I first started to think about audio books for Snow in Vietnam, and again, I'm a self-publisher, right? So all the costs and everything fall on me. I had asked Tracy uh, with Vietnamese Boat People to be my narrator because I just loved her voice. Mm. Um, and she said, yes, let's do it. But then, you know, life gets in the way and it just, we couldn't make it happen because she was so busy. Um, then came along Anne Pham and she lives in uh, Cali. She's, you know, an actress, a model, a humanitarian. She's just an amazing young lady. And um, she was on the Vietnamese Boat People podcast. That's how I, I found out about her. But she was going to narrate for me. And she started. She started down this journey. She she got halfway through it. And then life threw up on, on both of us. <laughs> um, so it's now just sitting with, you know, 15 or so chapters, 16 chapters read, not edited yet. And it's just sitting there. And at some oh. point, I'm like, you know, maybe I'll just read it myself. But I'm not a voice actor. Uh, and it's not a memoir, right? If it was a memoir, it would be one thing. So I don't know. Um, hopefully one day, if anybody wants to help me, <laughs> maybe. Well, and I bring that up because it opens up consumption in a totally different, you know, you open up more demographics, people like me who can't really, you know, I just, it's hard for me to read anymore. Um, and I, I walk a lot. I try to get 10 to 15,000 steps in a day. And so as I'm walking or I'm driving, I listen to books and it's such a pleasurable thing to do because you know, you're getting like agree. exercise in. Oh yeah, I totally agree. I'm an audiobook junkie as well. I consume mm -hmm. a lot of that. I consume podcasts. You know, it's just so easy to multitask so when you're doing that. And yeah. audiobooks, um, it's growing like crazy. It, really? I think in 2020, what, two years ago, it was like a $1.5 million industry. Um, and it's just, skyrocketing it's you know physical printed books are still the the preferred uh way to consume books but audiobooks are just yeah going nuts so i definitely want to tap into that market it's just how do i carve out that time for it you know i really do believe though if you did it um it would be awesome and it just takes a few pages or hours to get used to you know if you get a good mic you know get the the sure mics that are the four hundred dollar mics that everybody use for recording, singing, and podcasts. You mm -hmm. see them on all of them. It's like I can. These these mics are they they make your voice sound really good. And if you just go and and go at it for about a, an hour or two, and you just get used to it, you know, just read a little bit every day, and then record it. You'll find that it's just it's not that hard. And you you have a beautiful voice. You know, we. Oh, thank you. Yes, you do. And I think that if you got into so, some sort of rhythm with the with your voice and and got used to listening to it you can kind of manipulate the the sounds that are coming out and changing it to where you as an artist can really pinpoint how you want this to feel 
Yeah, I, it's something that I certainly thought about for 2023. Um, I've spoken to some, you know, audiobook producers and, and podcasters, and it really doesn't require a lot of money, right? Nothing. Like you just go into your closet, <laughs> um, absorb the sound. And one of the av- best advices I got was, you know, do it at the same time each day. Right. Um, and drink your water, have your green Granny Smith apple. Apparently that helps. Um, and then just go for it. Um, It'll take you three weeks to finish. Yeah. Okay. I think you're 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 putting something into my little. Um, yes, because you're all here. DIY, right? You're like everything's DIY. You're you're so self motivated, and you have so much initiative. Why, you know, um, you know, you can. I, here's where I here's where I come from. Your 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 soul and the feeling of who you are as a writer. Somebody like me would be thrilled to listen to your voice because you could tell me the story and I want to hear it from the writer's voice. Mm. That's, that's, that's where I come from uh, when I'm listening to audiobooks. The book that I'm right now, I'm like, I knock out two audiobooks a week. Um, I'm listening to Matthew McConaughey's uh, Green Light right now. Yeah. He's, he's an actor, right? And, but he wrote this and he kept journals for many years. And, his delivery, I, I cannot imagine anybody else reading it, his words, because it's just so perfect. And I imagine that when you read your book, the sensation that we all get as listeners and people who are, who are consuming the, the, the work that you put out, to listen to the actual author's voice, to me, is, is awesome. It's I think it depends, though, because, you know, memoirs are different than fiction. Um, memoirs... Of course, you want to hear it directly from the, the writer because it's their story. Fiction is is more acting. It really is. And I I don't know. I mean, I'll give it a try. But between my ghostwriting and helping my authors get their books yeah. out the door, it you know, it's a timing, not a not a wanting, but a timing issue. It's so true. It's a, a good point. The fiction yeah. and nonfiction part of it too. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I do agree that, you know, in my head, I'm, I feel like I can give some justice to the, to the book if I narrate it, because I understand the personalities behind my characters, right? I mean, I lived with them for two yeah. years in my head. <laughs> so, um, in that respect, yeah. and even when I listen to Anne, you know, um, narrate my book, I'm like, mm, I would have done it differently, but <laughs> all right, Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because, uh, you know, I don't believe in waiting myself, you know? I just believe, yeah. I believe in the DIY the, of the, you know, we're in the modern age. We should be able to do all this stuff um, if we want to. And if we enjoy it, we should be able to do it. Yeah, I do want to. And yeah. I, I do enjoy it. So I'll put it on my list, my to-do list. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll see you in 2023. Okay. <laughs> Amy, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. And again, I just want to thank you for the years now of support and the engagement and, you know, all the times I see you on IG and stuff like that. Sometimes I'm, I'm just really bad at responding and stuff like that. But for the most part, I see you and I'm very appreciative of all of the love and support all these years. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And it's been my honor um, to watch you as well, to be a part of this community, to grow. I hope you find whatever it is that you're looking for to the answer to, you know, what is, uh, being Vietnamese means to you. Maybe it's just a matter of looking in the mirror. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran. Special thanks to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcasts.